Okay. Oh, here we go. Hello, everyone. How are you going? Hello, Peter and Karen, Rob and Deb. Okay, welcome back. Hope you're healing well. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Sunday. Very brave. Hello, Cody and John. Dodgy, is it? You reminded me like at one minute to six <clears throat> that I hadn't plugged my um, my computer into the uh, into the modem, which is what I usually do to try and avoid dodgy internet here. So hopefully um, it's all working now. <laughs> Hello, Sarah and all the tricks. Hello, Sharpie and Rod. Lovely to see you. Um, yes, yeah, so big week. I'm a bit exhausted. Still got my cough, but it's getting better. Um, and I'm ready for a glass of Chardonnay. I don't know about you guys. So, um, hello, Paul and Rose. Lovely to see you. Um, oh, and I'm back at Muradak finally. It's taking me away. Hello, Craig. I thought you weren't joining us today. Is that Craig or is that someone? Um, is that Karen pretending to be Craig? Thought you were at work. Anyway, um, it's lovely to see you. Hello, Shell and Andrew. Hello, Emily. Uh, Kevin's finishing up. Yes. Sharpie and Rod, COVID does bad things to your taste bud and smell. And, um, yeah, I I don't think I've had it since June, but I've got something else going on with this cough. And, um, yeah, it's not well, it's not a lot of fun. Finally given in, I'm going to go and see the doctor tomorrow. So <laughs> let's see if they can sort me out. Um, hello, Sue and Daryl. Lovely to see you. Um, oh, oh, Craig. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, dear. Hello, Alison. Well, I'm sorry to hear events are being cancelled, but I'm very pleased to see you here. Polly's just come bursting through the door. Hello, Polly. We're going to have some Chardonnay. Yes, we're all very thirsty. Um, you'll see behind me we've got the flowers that Jill's done, which are lovely. But you'll also see my brother-in-law has been doing some painting and Mum bought one of them. You can't see it very well, but, um, uh, yeah, I can't even remember where he's selling them, but he's he's doing all these gorgeous paintings of... Um, of uh, of the rainforest around Warburton and um, and uh, yeah, mum's mum's bought one and it's lovely. So we're just trying to find the right place to put it. So we thought we'd show it off tonight. Um, I just cracked my bottle. We're having the uh, Robinson Vineyard Chardonnay 2020 that um, a couple of you would have had at lunch a few Sundays ago, but a lot of you haven't yet. So the launch of the 2020. 2020 Chardonnay. I'm going to tell you a very sad story about Chardonnay in a minute, but let's get this wine going first. All right. Wine in glass. Dad's been off at a Pinot Noir conference and he's trying, oh, Polly, Polly nearly, Polly needed a pat and nearly threw my, nearly helped me throw my glass of Chardonnay all over the, all over the keyboard pole. That would have been awful. Yeah, terrible. All right, we'll put this over here. Yeah, Richard's doing glasses. Jill and Peter are in the kitchen cooking. We've got a couple of functions on this weekend. Um, so it's just you guys and me at the moment. I'm sure they'll come wandering through looking thirsty any minute now. But anyway, um, Shell, what are you eating? Coriander, wally, noodle, salad. Oh, Women's Weekly. Wow, cool. Oh, well, let me know how it goes. So I've poured myself quite a big glass because I'm, I'm feeling a bit thirsty, but now it's hard to swirl. Anyway. Cheers, everyone. Let's have a little taste. Oh, my God, it's so gorgeous. So 2020 Robinson Chardonnay. We had the 2020 Estate Chardonnay a couple of weeks ago and, um, and we're now tasting the Robinson 2020 and we're going to be having the 2020 McIntyre in two weeks' time. Here's Richard. He's done the glasses. He's ready for a glass of Chardonnay. There you go, Dad. Um, oh, Kay's having a <laughs> chicken sanger and Terry's chicken sausage tie green curry one pot wonder. Oh, gosh. Wow. How exciting. Um, so, Robinson 2020. So, first of all, let me tell you the sad news about Chardonnay. And the sad news about Chardonnay is that the 2020 wow. Estate Chardonnay that we tasted two weeks ago is officially sold out. I know. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm so glad that you made it as well, Craig. It's fantastic. Uh, Alison, was Kate expecting us at five? No. <laughs> oh dear, we've got we've got someone 
spamming us again. Um, I'm going to ignore them uh, while I talk. Although, if I ignore them, are they just going to keep spamming us? Do I need to get rid of them? Um, how did we do last time? We did this, didn't we? Uh, remove. Um, Okay, sorry guys. I just let me get rid of this because it's very distracting, and I don't. We don't need free girls in our city. Thanks very much. Um, and yeah, they, you know, uh, put user in timeout. Oh, should I put them in a timeout? Find user on this channel. There you go. We'll get rid of them. Get rid of them. Remove report. Go away. Okay. Ah, unwanted. There we go. Got it. I think we got rid of them. Oh, stop it. Okay, right. Chardonnay, Robinson, Chardonnay, 2020. So it's State Chardonnay, 2020. We started selling it only a few weeks ago and um, we only made a little bit more than 200 dozen and we've just sent the last of it to our distributors in Melbourne and I've got a little tiny bit left for my distributors in Sydney and we've had to stop selling it at Cellar Door. The good news is that we tasted the 2021 Estate Chardonnay and we think we're pretty happy to release that. So we're not going to not have Chardonnay over summer. It's just we're moving on to the next vintage. Hello, Jeff. How are you going? Cheers. I think you might have forgotten to take some Chardonnay, but hopefully you've got something nice to drink. So the 2020 Robinson Chardonnay, 2020 as you'll remember, we talked, scraped in for the 2020. Well done, Shell. Um, <laughs> um, the, um, <coughs> sorry, my brain just went blank for a minute there. That's the problem with this, uh, with this, whatever it is that I've got that's making me cough and be tired. Anyway, I'm back again now. Um, the 2020 vintage was a was a vintage that was kind of plagued by difficulties, but they're not, they weren't the difficulties that a lot of people remember 2024. If you remember, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, it was the year when we had the big bushfires at the beginning of the, at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. And so there was a lot of smoke around. Um, and then COVID, the pandemic started in, um, well, some, most people say March. It was probably February, maybe December in 2019. Anyway. We became aware of uh, of this thing called COVID fairly early on in the year that was 2020. Um, in the vineyard, however, it was quite a cool year, but we had terrible weather during flowering and fruit sets, so we got a really small crop, particularly of Chardonnay. So um, we were able to make just a small amount of estate Chardonnay and even smaller amounts of this wine and the wine that we're going to taste in two weeks' time. So we released this wine to the wine club I think two or three weeks ago and um, I really if you like this wine tonight and if you enjoy the McIntyre Chardonnay in two weeks time don't hang around and think oh, I'll order that in a few weeks months time because it won't be here anymore it's running out the door very fast so why is it doing that well I think it's a lovely wine I think it's very young but I think it's looking absolutely gorgeous, the 2020 Robinson. And in a way, I think um, really right at the moment, the 2020 Robinson Chardonnay is my favourite of our 2020 Chardonnays. It's really vibrant. So it's got this beautiful kind of dark um, dark lemon or sort of pale gold. It's hard to say. The light's not very good in here tonight. Um, let's say pale gold because it is a little bit goldy in colour, less green sometimes. Um, there is a very much a particularly beautiful clarity about about this wine Craig I agree on the nose it's got this gorgeous kind of um really fruit forward lemon citrus fruit character it's also got some really lovely um really lovely um almost lemon blossom um and white blossom kind of aromatics on the nose it's uh, it's got a little bit of um, it's also got a little bit of salted lemon rind, so you've got a little bit of that preserved lemon character coming through. But it's really it's very citrusy, I think, and it just kind of that citrus sort of layers and layers of different sort of aspects of lemon, which is really rather gorgeous, and it's quite intense on the nose. Um, 
makes me want to keep smelling it. It smells also a little bit like lemon curd. It's got it, just all sorts of lemony things um, for me uh, of this wine. So it's got this tanginess, but it's also got, because it's all different types of lemon um, characters sort of layered one on top of the other, it's got a richness that it's it, that it achieves without being heavy, which I think is like, there you go, Craig, we <laughs> on the same line. On the palette, for my WSCT people out there, it's obviously dry. It's got pretty high acidity and that acid is, again, very lemony in character. It's got high acid, quite lemony, quite tangy. Uh, there's a little bit of white nectarine coming through on the palate that I didn't see on the nose, um, but still all those different lemon aromatics and flavours coming through on the palate. It's very linear. So what I mean by that is that it sort of travels in a very straight line down the middle of your tongue when you, when you um, swallow it. Um, but it's got this beautiful line to it. It's not short at all and it's not lacking in intensity. It's just very focused in the direction it wants to go, which is in a straight line, straight down your tongue, straight down your throat. Um, it's almost, it's like, it's like the slice of lemon um, at the end of a really great gin and tonic, I reckon. Medium plus acidity, Renee. I would, I would say somewhere, oh, sorry, uh, it's not Renee. It's, <laughs> it's you, Nigel. I would call this, I would call this um, uh, either medium plus acidity or even high acidity in this wine, but medium plus would get you a mark for sure. Um, I think the acid's high. Yes, Jeff. Um, this wine has a little bit of uh, new oak in its maturation, but it doesn't show in the wine. It's very pure. There's a tiny little bit of a cedar note there right in the background it's very subtle though so I think it's really nicely balanced um, it certainly doesn't have the strap match character Craig um, so the strap match character is a character that comes from um, the opposite of oxidation which is reduction um, and we try to avoid that in our wines we do see it in very small levels in some of our Chardonnays but this wine certainly doesn't have any of that it's very clean very pure um, very focused. Um, Kay's getting a touch of wheatgrass on the nose. Um, no, I can't imagine it would work with the curry. I did say in my um, note yesterday, I'm really sorry that my email didn't come out until yesterday. I did say I don't think that the wine is going to work with anything with chilli or spice because it's so pure. But a good chicken sandwich, fantastic. A nice plate of oysters, freshly shucked. You don't even need to squeeze lemon on it because you've got so much lemon flavour in the wine. And I'm going to sneeze, so um, excuse me for a <laughs> minute. Goodness. Sorry. Um, there's something about this seat. I was sitting here in a meeting earlier today and all of a sudden I started sneezing. I think one of the cats has maybe, um, has maybe come and, um, has maybe come and uh, left some hair or something here. There's something definitely making me hay fevered at my favourite seat at the table, which is very annoying. Um, I shall persist, though. Um, <laughs> I think um, I think also um, we were talking um, about COVID and how that changes your sense of smell and taste. Um, the wall in the background is absolutely doing the whole estate label thing now, isn't it, Jeff? So if anyone hasn't noticed... Um, the estate label is actually a picture of the Ramdurth wall of the winery, but we have Ramdurth wall here too, if you can see, and it looks just like the looks just like the label. If you just cut a square out here, it's pretty much the estate label. Um, what IDK, Jeff? I don't understand your IDK. What you there? Yeah. Okay, so. Sonia, advice on how to get oysters home without losing their juice. That's quite tricky. Um, my, my, um, what will slightly annoy you is that I'll say if you buy your oysters unshucked and learn how to shuck oysters, then you'll always have the lovely juice in the oyster because they're nicely closed until you take the lid off. Um, otherwise, I think you just you need to have someone in the front seat of the car sitting next to you holding them very gently but yes shut them at home absolutely very good with the cashews in the salad absolutely and I think yeah it could cope with the coriander and lime it's just chili and curry 
um, flavors that I think that this wine will um, will will really um, struggle with. Also, just to finish my tasting note, it's got beautiful length to it. It's not, as I said, it's not kind of big and round and rich, but the flavor goes on for quite a long time. So it's got good length. Um, the finish is long. Uh, and I think it's a really lovely wine and it's drinking beautifully now. If you do buy it and put it in the cellar, it's going to sell a really nicely for at least 10 years, probably longer, but it will develop um, some extra complexity and depth. That's all right, Jeff. I totally understand. If you, if you write more nonsense words, I'll just assume that you didn't mean them. Um, and if I don't answer your question that you're asking, you'll just have to ask again or prompt me. Um, oh, God, I'm getting all snuffly again. Sorry, guys. Um, this might be a short drinks with Kate <laughs> if I get snuffly and sneezy again. Um, I have taken all my hay fever medication today as well, and it's just not cutting the mustard right now. Okay, so um, so beautiful with fresh oysters. It would be great with prawns. Um, if you've got pan-fried scallops, I always like a pan-fried scallop in a little bit of butter, a bit of lemon squeezed over the top would be beautiful with this. You could have them in a, in a pasta or you could have them in a risotto and that would be rather lovely as well. So, um, yeah, what else can I say about this wine? So it's the Robinson Vineyard and we've talked about the Robinson Vineyard many times before, but for those of you who maybe haven't heard about the Robinson Vineyard, um, uh, it's, it's a vineyard that's about five kilometres to the south of us. It was owned, it was established and owned until last year by Hugh and Isabel Robinson. Um, and they sold it and the new owners are lovely and are very interested in continuing the relationship that we have with them so we can keep taking the fruit for the time being, which is awesome and hopefully for a long time into the future if possible. I've got doggos who are asking for snacks from Richard. They're all being very naughty. We've got Molly and Frodo, you don't usually bark, and Tallulah, who's the yucky one. <laughs> Excuse me. What a horrible, snortily, snuffly nose I've got. Um, okay, so Sonia, the Robinson Vineyard is, as I say, five kilometres to the south of us. It's a big vineyard. Um, it's about 80, uh, 80 acres under vine and the property itself is just over 100 acres, so it's a big property. Um, it's uh, it, it's um, a little closer to sea level than the McIntyre Vineyard. So McIntyre Vineyard, at the top of the McIntyre Vineyard, we're about 90 metres above sea level. At the top of the Robinson Vineyard, they're about 60 metres above the sea level. Also, the McIntyre Vineyard's on top of a hill, whereas the Robinson Vineyard's in sort of a sort of an amphitheatre. So you can see the hills around and they shelter the vineyard a little bit. Um, it means that you've got vines that are planted on a north-facing slope and a slightly east and slightly west-facing slope. So you've got... Um, some different aspects for different ripeness levels, different flavour profiles. Um, the soil's very similar, but slightly, uh, slightly rockier and slightly, um, slightly more clay in the subsoil. So the root system is a little shallower than it is in the McIntyre Vineyard. So lots of little differences, which give us a very different shaped wine. Um, this wine is made in exactly the same way as the estate chardonnay that we had two weeks ago and as the mcintyre chardonnay that we're going to have in two weeks so if you can remember what this wine tastes like for two weeks you'll remember and you'll you'll be amazed at how different they are for exactly the same wine making which i think is very cool um jeff i think the blossom is it's a it's a it's like a fruit tree blossom or a lemon lemon blossom i said before i think that's definitely there um peter and karen ali specials prawn and scallop pots in cream sauce uh, crayfish sausage rolls. Ooh, sounds slightly crazy, um, but I will take your word for it that they are good matches and are probably delicious. Um, so a couple of questions about who else uses Robinson fruit from Sharpie and Rod and Robin Deb. Um, so there are other there are other, other um, businesses that take fruit from the Robinson Vineyard. I know that um, Peringa Estate takes fruit. I know they take Pinot Noir. I'm not sure if they take Chardonnay. Um, I think they do. But I don't think they make a uh, – they, they certainly – they've started making a single vineyard Robinson Pinot, but I'm not sure if they make a single vineyard Robinson Chardonnay. So that might not be a possible comparison. I'm not sure who else takes um, Chardonnay from the Robinson Vineyard, but I know – Who does? Barney Flanders does, um, Garagiste. 
Uh, again, he doesn't make it at, labelled as a Robinson Vineyard Chardonnay, but he may very well bottle it separately. So I will speak to him and see if he keeps that fruit separate and if he does which wine it is. So we may, maybe could do a comparison there. There's quite a few people who take a bit of fruit from them. The, Stonia do too, but they're in the process of trying to sell their business at the moment, so I'm not really sure where they're up to with anything. They've sold it? Okay, cool. Dad's got all the gossip. Who? What? Breaking news. Do you know who bought it? A consortium of local people managed to buy Stonia, so I guess we'll find out. Treasury, yes, Jeff, so Treasury was, Treasury, Stonia was owned by Treasury, um, I believe. Is that right, Dad? Were they owned by Treasury or no. they weren't the most recent owners? They were once upon a time, I think. But anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. Boring. Um, there's lots of people who take the Chardonnay. It used to go into Yatana before Yatana became 100% Tasmanian fruit. Um, so, yeah, um, there's some really good, there's some beautiful fruit being grown, but I don't think there's anyone else making a single vineyard Robinson Chardonnay at the moment. But Maybe there will be in the future. There, are, there is at least one other Robinson Pinot Noir out there, which is the Paringa um, Estate. So that could be an interesting comparison when we're doing Pinot Noirs. We particularly like this fruit. It's a couple of clones that we don't have. Um, well, we've got one in our vineyard now, but they're very young vines. So they're clones that came from Dijon University. Um, 15, 20 years ago now, um, 95 and 96 they're called, very sexy names. Um, and we've planted some 95 and some uh, Mendoza here. But those vines, um, I think we got our first crop off them last year or the year before, so um, they still, they're still need a bit more time to develop maturity of root system to give us really high-quality fruit. So um, I think that that purity of fruit partly comes from the site and partly comes from the clones, the clonal selection that we're taking from Robinson. The other thing that's important to say is that the um, the Robinson single vineyard wines that we make come from fruit from the same vines every year. So we basically lease a portion of the Robinson vineyard. And so comparing year after year, it's comparing like with like. Um, Oh, no, Cody, I'm buffering, am I? Oh, dear. All right. Well, lovely to see you. Thank you for popping in. Um, I hope wine is tasting good despite the fact that you can't see me. Um, and hopefully other people are not having the same problem. Hopefully it's your end. Um, what are the oldest vines in the Monitor Peninsula, Craig asks. Well, Craig, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the oldest vines that we know of that, uh, that were planted down here are the vines that are the same age as me so 50 years old at um at LG Park yep um Cabernet vines I think mostly um and then there are some Pinot Noir and Chardonnay vines that were planted at Main Ridge Estate in 1975 and some Chardonnay vines that were planted at Muruduk Estate in 1983. Now, there are a few other vineyards that were planted before we planted Muruduk. Um, <laughs> thank you, Alison. You're hilarious. <laughs> um, when Mum and Dad bought this property, um, so let's see if we can count them up. So we had LG Park, Main Ridge Estate. Stonia was planted in the late 70s. Um, mm, Dramana Estate was a year ahead of us. Um, uh, Main uh, Merrick's Estate. Oh, there's a couple of cockatoos on the balcony who are kissing each other and grooming each other. It's very sweet. It's very cute. Um, and uh, is that it? There weren't very many anyway. Um, and so, yeah, so the oldest vines down here are 50 years old, as far as we know, that are producing grapes and making wine today. Um, our oldest vines will be 40 next year, so that's pretty good as well. Um, and there's been a lot of development since then. Um, oh, it is not so cute when they eat your deck. That's right, Sharpie and Rod. Um, yeah, Peter and Karen, I mentioned Main Ridge Estate. They, they planted vines in 1975. Um, they were one of the first... Um, one of the first wineries, second winery down here. Um, it is amazing the industry's grown up so quickly. And Sharpie and Rod, just to, just to your point, 
Um, they don't eat our deck, the cockatoos, because Jill feeds them an obscene amount of seeds. So um, there's so much, so many uh, wild bird seeds out there that they have no appetite for eating the deck here at Muradak. But um, there are lots of other birds and rodents who like to eat the leftover seeds. So <laughs> good old Jill. Yeah, absolutely. Craig is asking, do I think that some Pinot clones have now adapted to the Mornington Peninsula specifically? Um, well, that we, Craig, you're taking me right off topic because we're drinking Chardonnay, but I can certainly, I can certainly have a stab at answering that question. Um, I don't think, I don't think the Mornington Peninsula specifically has um, had clones adapt to the region, but I think that there are certain clones that are particularly happy um, in our region and I think that there's a lot of clonal discussion particularly about Pinot Noir but now more when we're talking about Chardonnay as well but Chardonnay is something that we've only really started talking about clones in the last well the geeks have been talking about clones in Chardonnay for about 15 years but most people haven't really been aware of the importance of clonal selection in Chardonnay until a few years ago I don't think and uh, I think what we've really discovered is that wherever you plant a clone, it will behave slightly differently. So there are certainly clones that we think were bad selections in the early days and they came, they were selected by viticulturists who were specialised in uh, warm climate viticulture in Australia so they didn't really know anything about Pinot Noir and they went looking for um, clones of Pinot that were easy to grow, upright varieties and that cropped high. Hello, Barry, lovely to see you. Um, uh, and so those clones were not great. They came from UC Davis, so we planted some of those in the early days and we've pulled them all out since. Um, there are other clones that work well in some sites and not so well in other sites. MV6 is a clone that people talk about a lot in Australia and it was the first Pinot Noir clone to come to Australia back when um, James Busby was bringing wine, uh, grape vines from France to propagate in Australia. He went to Clevougeau and got some Pinot Noir and planted those vines up in the 18, up in um, the Hunter Valley in about 1831. Um, and they kind of stayed in the Hunter Valley for about 150 years and then um, and the poor Pinot vines. Hunter is not a place to grow Pinot Noir really. Um, and kind of went into low end sparkling wine or mixed red blends um, and then people started getting interested in growing Pinot Noir down here in the cooler climates and MV6 was brought down here and has done very very well. Um, the other clones that we talk about quite regularly on the Mornington Peninsula that we think do well in certain sites down here a lot of people like 114 and 115. Um, I think we like 115 better here at Muradak. Uh, a lot of people really like pomard other people don't like pomard at all we quite like pomard here and we like pomard sometimes at the robinson vineyard um but sometimes it doesn't it doesn't work as well as other times um there's the able clone that came illegally to new zealand originally uh, in a gumboot um and then came to australia and we think that works pretty well down here as well 667 is another one that we like um, so yeah there's a lot of clones most of them have pretty unsexy names um, and you know we vinify all of our parcels of fruit and all our clonal selections separately um, and so we keep we keep um, them all separate until we're making final decisions about what's going to go where um, <laughs> Craig everything goes to New Zealand in a gumboot indeed um, so we're hoping next year to do some um, do some events during vintage uh, where and after vintage where you can maybe book in. We'll have like little groups and you can come down and taste some things from barrel and maybe maybe do some clonal um, comparisons and have a look at unfinished wine. Uh, as I've mentioned before, next year we're going to be celebrating um, forty years of having vines in the dirt here at Muradaka Estates. So we're hoping to do some really good events and. Uh, and because it's looking at the moment with the weather that we've been having that we might have quite a small vintage again, which is not great, but we have a lot of people. Um, Craig, I see that Peter. What? <laughs> what about Peter? 
Peter, uh, Peter agree totally. I don't understand who. Oh, agreeing with Peter and Karen. Yes, definitely. Sorry, I thought you were talking about my brother Peter, who's out cooking in the in the kitchen. I'm like, obviously, my brain's not quite here tonight. Um, yeah, there's definitely a salty character coming into the wine as it opens up, and I think that's really lovely. That salted lemon, um, preserved lemon, Moroccan kind of uh, character that makes it. Um, makes you a little bit thirsty and a little bit hungry at the same time. So I think that's quite cool. But, yeah, so hopefully next year we're going to do a whole heap of really cool events and we'll give you plenty of notice about them. Um, we'll be very organised, which I know we're not always famous for. But um, come and if you're interested in the different clones of Pinot Noir and even of Chardonnay, then it might be a nice opportunity for you to come and have a little little barrel tasting and see how they, how they sort of express themselves differently here at Murudak anyway. Guys, I'm getting more snuffly and sniffly and um, it's very unattractive for me to sniffle and snuffle on um, on camera uh, in front of you all. So I think that unless anyone's got any really kind of probing questions that you would like me to answer tonight, I think we might finish up in a moment. Um, what? There's plenty of wine left in my glass. Richard and Jill have still got a bit there too. So hopefully you guys have got a bit that's going well with the foods that you selected. The other food I didn't talk about was cheese because, of course, obviously Gruyere is fantastic with this wine. But also this is a lovely wine with a nice right, little brie or something like that. So um, I'm so glad that you um, that you love this, Craig. I think it's looking fantastic. Um, as I said, uh, the... the um, the, the, the vintage was the production in 2020 was really, really small. So we made just over 100 cases of this wine, 100 dozen of this wine, and we sold quite a lot of it already. So so do not delay if you want to order it. Um, I'm going to stop the hard sell there. Um, there was a little question from, thank you, Kay. I'll be, I'll be better one day, I promise. Um, uh, what, uh, Rob and Deb wanted to know how the vines are looking. So they're looking all right. They don't like this weather. They want some sunshine and some warm weather and a bit of a a bit less, a little bit less rain, please, and a little bit less wind and a bit more warmth and a bit more sunshine would be lovely. The um, the laterals are looking a little bit stunted, and the ends of the vines are looking a little bit yellow, and they look like they've sort of tried to start flowering and then they've tried to stop flowering and maybe if the weather gets nicer um, then we'll maybe get uh, we'll maybe get a little bit more sunshine and we'll get flowering recommencing so we haven't look we're not slitting our wrists yet but we're a bit sad about the weather at this time of year and it's the, it's four years in a row I think that we've had this kind of weather at this time of year which is particularly sad for Chardonnay production um, and I'm so sick I was talking to another um, I'm so sick I'm so sick of having to say to people, production levels are down, but quality is fantastic. I'd really like to be able to say quality is great and we also have enough wine to sell everyone as much as they want. So um, hopefully hopefully one day we'll be able to say that again. Um, in the meantime, um, yeah, I know. I know it's nearly summer and we haven't had any spring yet. So anyway, uh, all Drinks with Kate boxes. Jill should come with a slab of Gruyere in future. Is the uh, is the um, request from Peter and Karen? Um, that could be logistically tricky, but you know, never say never. Um, okay, team, I'm going to go. Uh, next week we're going to be drinking a guest wine, our first guest wine for a little while. It's the Amber, which is a Pinot Gris on skins made by Port Phillip Estate. I think I la I think I bought the last four dozen from them. Um, to put into your boxes. So um, so I hope you can join me next week uh, to talk about Pinot Gris on skins from another producer who I really admire here on the peninsula. Um, uh, I, it'll probably just be me again, but, you know, if I can get someone from Port Phillip Estate on the chat, that would be awesome. Um, I promise I will be much weller and less snuffly and coffee by next week. Awesome to see you. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you next week. Cheers. Oh, where's my button? Oh, no. Here we go. I'll say cheers again. Cheers. Love you all. <laughs>